visiting the Hawk Talk. I'm here with Paul Hedrick. How are you? I'm great, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So got to kick it off. I assume the day you're born, you, you know, come out of the womb, kick on some cowboy boots and start, you know, kicking around in style, right? That's just love at first sight with the boots. That's exactly right. I was born in cowboy boots. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I uh, like I was born and raised uh, in Texas, uh, nice. born in We're Houston, about. Texas, ended up uh, moving to Dallas when I was pretty young. So uh, I grew up there and went to high school there. Uh, but yeah, like any good Texan kid, I had a pair of red ropers, uh, yep. probably age five or so. And you know, would romp around the grocery store and whatnot in those. And um, probably wasn't until college, really, that I started to get back into it. Um, and where'd you go to school? And I went to Harvard for okay. undergrad. Um, yeah. Well, that was the only school I went to. I didn't go to grad school. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I ended up getting into to boots around the, my senior year again. And nice. I was getting a little homesick, was thinking about moving back to Texas after college. and. Uh, yeah, that was the beginning of the of the love, I'd, I'd say. And so, taking it back, like, tell me more about like your upbringing, your parents. Like, were your parents entrepreneurial? Like, what was childhood like? I had a very fortunate childhood. I, you know, grew up in a nice neighborhood. Uh, had parents who uh, were very supportive of me and my uh, two siblings, and you know, by and large, let us do what we want to do. Um, neither of them were entrepreneurs. My mom was a nurse and my uh, dad was a consultant actually for most of his career, uh, management consultant. And, you know, uh, which I I didn't really know what that meant when I was a kid, of course. (laughs) I just (laughs) knew it meant traveling a lot and doing business things. Um, So uh, yeah, they really let us foster our own interests. And, and, you know, me personally, I, my interest passed all over the place. Yeah, so tell me about it. Like, what were the early, like, what you want to be when you grow up when you're, like, four years old? What were you saying? Well, four years old, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Batman. Uh, but I think just beyond <laughs> that, <laughs> uh, I was really into rocks and fossils. A little bit I wanted, for a little while, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Uh, you know, this was in the Jurassic Park era, of course, yeah. in the 90s. Um, I then was pretty creative. Uh, So I actually, for many years, thought I wanted to do something creative, whether that was actual art or actually when I was uh, in middle school, I wanted to be a comic book artist. And then in high school, that sort of graduated to wanting to be an architect. Uh, And it really wasn't until uh, I graduated and went up to college that I started thinking about business and uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I wouldn't. I wasn't one of those kids who, you know, was was selling lemonade and starting a business every year. And that was never me, really. I was more drawn to to making stuff. Yeah, and then I think the creativity in different comes out in different ways. And were your parents ever like trying to guide you on profession, or just kind of like you want to be an architect, a paleontologist, whatever? Sounds great. Whatever you want, it makes you happy. How what was their kind of dynamic? Yeah, that that was definitely more the latter. It was more uh, supportiveness, and you know, I, both of the, neither of them grew up with a ton of money. Both of them ended up going to a good college and uh, you know, pursuing their own passions. You know, so I think in many ways, my my generation, my siblings were more in the camp of, hey, we worked really hard. Let's you, know, you guys can get and do what you want. Um, my sister is a, a therapist. My uh, brother started out uh, in tech and nonprofit and then now is uh, uh, working in business as well. So uh, yeah, it, it was it was a nice environment. And I, I think because of that, but we all had different personalities, of course. Um, and this is where nature and nurture can, uh, I think uh, the, the debate can begin. Yeah. I was, for some reason, I was always really self-motivated. I was the, the kid in my family who was always found my own way to, to play with my toy. I didn't need to be, bo- I didn't bother my parents a lot of my siblings a lot. I I was a bookworm as soon as I was able to be, I was lost in my own universe a lot of the time. And, and, and it led to me, I think, being a pretty self-motivated person. And so. And I love that you bring up the nature versus nurture thing. It's, uh, I have a new, our first baby is about to turn a year and you realize that they're born with their personality. Like that's something I, that was the biggest surprise as a parent that I've ever I've had period was like, 
three days in, I saw her personality and it's held up that way. And so that's pretty so, cool. Yeah, it is really cool to see. It's like there is so much nature involved in personality that, you know, you could similar what you said. I have two, two siblings as well that we are very different. Like we have a lot of similar values and like we've been taught similar things, but the, our personality, what gets us excited, very different. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. So uh, when did you like, obviously there's, you know, a level of achievement aspiration and like, you know, focus to want to go to a, an Ivy League, to go to Harvard, something like that. Like, when did that kick in when you're like, I want to go to one of the top, if not the top school in the country? I'd say on the education front, there was a couple uh, points in my journey that, one, that, that, were, that were impactful. One of which was in eighth grade, my uh, parents encouraged me to consider going to a different school uh, ahead of high school because uh, I was, you know, I was in the was kind of called, referred to as the parochial school system in, in Dallas, and it was a good school. Uh, and but everyone, all of my friends were kind of going to this one school that was probably it was bigger. It was a very well-rounded school. It was a great school, you know, better athletics overall. Uh, good education, but there was a much smaller school <laughs> that had a reputation of sort of being the quirky, I'd say more nerdy school. Uh, and uh, yeah, I ended up, I don't even, I don't even remember being part of the decision to be honest, but I probably was, I was in eighth grade, um, had some agency in my, in my life, but not a ton. Um, and I went there and then that was really what showed me, uh, you know, because I was an outsider, I was the only you know, I think it was one of two kids joining that grade. And so I had to, you know, make new friends and um, dive into a much more rigorous academic environment. And uh, I got really dedicated to it. Uh, it became, you know, one of those things that, be, that sparked my competitive juices. I, I was never a, I played sports, you know, I, it's, it's easy to be a captain of the sports team when you've got 40, 40 guys in your class, but I was able to do a, a couple of those things, but I, I knew, you know, from eighth, ninth grade, I certainly wasn't going to be going to college or uh, for any other reason than, than probably my brain and my work ethic. So yeah, that's when I started really working on it, getting serious. And then, yeah, high school was awesome. I, I, we had amazing teachers. Uh, it was an amazing system that they put me through and it really opened my eyes to, you know, what you could do uh, yeah. with that sort of environment. And I always wanted to go to Notre Dame. I grew up one, you know, a Notre Dame fan. That's where my parents met. That's where my dad oh, went. Cool. Um, and yeah, that actually is where I uh, was going to go. I ended up getting waitlisted uh, or rejected everywhere else except Notre Dame. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, had a little bit of a, hey, should I try to get off the waitlist in these places? And that was that moment where I just said, yeah, sure, let's, let's try to get into Harvard. Um, see if it works out and started sending them letters and got some advice from other people on how to get off the wait list and didn't think it would work and then it worked and it was a little surreal and yeah you know showed up a few months later and how was it how was the experience at Harvard uh, you know it, it obviously has a little bit of like a <laughs> well obviously has a reputation right it, it's it, it is what it is uh, it has a little bit of a mystical reputation as someone who's going there without having, I never even visited before I got in. Um, uh, I didn't even know that it was like a, in an urban environment. I thought it was going to be, you know, sort of like Notre Dame and, uh, you know, kind of a big campus driven environment. Um, it's not like that as it is in the city, <laughs> but it was great. I, I'd say the, the, the big takeaways for people who are curious were one, it was normal. It was college. It was everything that you think, you know, it's a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds going out and having their collegiate experience and as much, you know, awkwardness and fun and partying and, and studying as there is anywhere else probably. Um, just as many cliques and groups and athletes and nerds and even within that environment, definitely all, all kinds of kinds and, you know, figuring out where you fit in is just as much a part of the, the culture there as it is anywhere else. Uh, I was maybe a little surprised by that. I had a lot of fun in college. Um, you know, I was a bookworm and, um, you know, pretty, pretty nerdy in, in high school. And I, you know, let college, I let loose a little bit more in college, I would say. <laughs> and uh, that was possible. I think the big thing for me was I just realized 
I, there's so many amazing people out there. And if I was going to stand out, I was going to have to tell a different story. Uh, you know, I wasn't the number one person in the country at anything, you know, uh, probably not even the top one, you know, point one percent in anything. And, you know, Harvard has a lot of those people. Yeah. And, and so I kind of, you know, that was when I decided, you know, being well-rounded, which is something I'd already been doing uh, for a lot of my life. Maybe I should, maybe being really well-rounded at a few really interesting things could be my thing. And yeah, I, I, it was possible there. I wouldn't say it was super easy, uh, but you know, got out, yeah. got out, <laughs> got out with a degree. I will say I didn't. <laughs> I certainly it's, didn't graduate top of my class. <laughs> no, and as you said, you're literally with the best in the world. Like, even being in the room, I think, has creates a lot of growth in its own right. So that makes sense. Um, and during college, did you know what you want to do after? Like, did you go there saying, like, this was, like I have a plan? Or it was like, I got into Harvard, now I got to figure this out? And, like, at what point did you start thinking about what's next? Man, I really did not know what anything was. I, I felt so out of place in some of this conversation would be, you know, there's a lot of real like, career oriented people there, um, maybe expectedly. A lot of people who, who you know, at 18 years old knew exactly what an iBanker was and a, what, what the difference between banking and consulting was and, you know, what the derivatives trader, or, you know, what, all this stuff that, that like, you know, candidly, I, it took me fumbling through some interviews without doing any, enough research to even, you know, com coming out pretty embarrassed, to, to be honest, to figure out, or right, maybe I should actually figure out what some of these jobs are in the business, you know, quote unquote universe, because by that point, I knew that I wasn't going to have as sharp a view on what I wanted to do. And I wanted to find something that was generalist, either in the, you know, operating universe, consulting universe, or, or, or even uh, financial universe. You know, I measured in economics with a minor in math, so I, you know, definitely was more oriented toward. And where uh, did that come from? Why why economics and math? Because you picked that going in, right? Yeah, math was my kind of my thing in high school. Uh, you know, I, I that was definitely the subject that I spent the most time on, and and probably you know enjoyed the most. I think in retrospect, because I had great teachers, I did not enjoy it as much in college. But <laughs> is what it is. I was actually on a different path. It was called applied math and uh, applied math to economics. And then basically sophomore year, after uh, midway through college, I realized my junior and senior year were going to be really hard and not a lot of fun if I kept along. And so I realized I, the, the honest answer is I realized I already had almost most of my credits to, to, for an econ major. Uh, and I could take like half elective senior year if I wanted to, if I switched to econ. So yeah, that's the, that's the real answer. I, mean, I, <laughs> I think, I think cool. in my class out of 1600 graduates, roughly, I believe, I mean, it was a huge number that graduated with economics. I think it was 400 or 500, oh, got like it. a third of the class graduates yeah. with that degree. I mean, it's kind yeah. of a joke, to be honest. <laughs> and what did you think you, so you liked math and then it parlayed into economics, that makes sense. What, at what point did you start thinking what you were gonna do with it? Even not like you just started thinking, okay, probably management consulting, or as you said, like in- I think it, by the time I got into interviews, I realized that at a liberal arts school, you don't actually learn anything that you're supposed to <laughs> learn for it. I don't know if it's liberal arts schools. Like I think it's most colleges. Like you just most kind of colleges them. maybe. Yeah. yeah, it was easy for us to poke, you know, and say, hey, why aren't we being taught how to use Excel? And yeah, you, even to take an accounting class, you had to go to MIT, like which a lot of oh wow uh, Got kids it. did. Yeah, there, there literally was no business undergrad coursework. Zero. I didn't realize that about Harvard. Got it. Which is why so many people major in economics because yeah. it's sort of the closest thing yep. to business, but it really isn't. Um, it really has nothing to do with business. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of, you know, theory and and uh, anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of realized by junior year that I'm going to have to go do all this stuff on my own. I'm going to have to figure out what what path I want and. Um, you know, honestly, I kind of st stumbled into what I ultimately ended up doing right after college. Uh, it was a, my, my first job was in, was in options trading. So, I mean, I interviewed everywhere. I interviewed in consulting, banking, trading, 
uh, everywhere that it related to uh, sort of business services and financial services, uh, which at the time seemed like sort of the only place to get a generalist training. What year in was that? Business. 2010 is when I graduated. So okay. I so would say markets are starting to. Mod- I would say pretty bad time. Yeah. Um, not as bad as the class before me, who. Yeah. You know, 2009. I was before you, but we, we, I got right into yeah. 2008. <laughs> yeah, you either, yeah, you basically started right when it happened and you basically, yeah, in a job I didn't go into finance, saved. but I went into real estate, which was almost as bad. But my finance friends mostly got either jobs rescinded or laid off right away because it was first, yeah. out, first out kind of thing. Well, in this in this kind of you know kind of cutthroat culture, you know, everyone's trying to get the internship to, that then leads to the job, and so everyone who who I knew who it was in two thousand nine who had the internship in summer two thousand eight got their jobs rescinded and had to scramble. They're you know, supposed to be partying and having fun senior year, and they're all scrambling to get anything. So yeah. I would say it was a little better than that, but not much. Um, yeah. I really wanted to work in consulting and all of the all the consulting firms. Uh, I thought I did that. That was where I set my sights, I should say. Um, all the consulting rooms cut their hiring classes by, you know, 50%. So it was still pretty hard. Um, and yeah, I ended up uh, getting a job at an options trading firm in Chicago that I did briefly, but had a lot of fun. And then I actually sort of moonlit um, studying for my case uh, interviews even after I started that job and then ended up getting a job at McKinsey and management consulting that fall after I'd already started my other job and then uh, joined kind of halfway through that hiring cycle. Got it. So you've got the on paper pedigree, man, Harvard to McKinsey. So yeah, mentioned- just don't ask either of them how well I did. <laughs> I <laughs> did so work there. The <laughs> and I did graduate. <laughs> Yeah, you made it through, man. That's what counts. And uh, let's be real. We, as we both know, like, when's the last time you looked at a resume and asked for their GPA from college? Like, yeah, yeah. it goes away pretty quick. Um, I'm glad I'm not to list mine anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Me, uh, hopefully you or I don't have to go around with our resumes anytime soon. <laughs> but uh, and so you mentioned starting to wear cowboy boots again, senior year, right, of college. Yeah. And that was kind of a way to connect back home. You said you were a little homesick. Like, that's what it was about. You're like, I'm Texan. I want to rock these things. Like, was yeah, it- that that is that is yeah. what it was about. It, yeah. um, I I don't know. I just I, I started to appreciate more about where I was from. I I really liked you know meeting everyone that I met and seeing getting a global perspective uh, from such a having such a diverse class as you do in these in these places. But I, you know, I I identified as you know, with, with my home, you know, and, and I, I was proud of it. I was also probably a little, you know, I was 21 year old, 21 years old and probably a little obnoxious about it. You know, I was in the Texas club and listening to country music and, you know, trying to be a little iconic. That was the version, I was that was say, my that's... version of being iconoclast at, at, at Harvard was, was kind of sticking to those guns, if not maybe even more so than I would have. When, as you said, you got the best of everything in the world or not everything, but you get what I'm saying is all these high achievers and like you, you want to find your place in that group. And if you can be the Texan, like, and that start, and you start getting that positive feedback of like, you know, you were, I'm sure people made comments good and bad on the boots and stuff like that. And it started to be a thing. You've got an international class that, you know, that Texas spirit is something of legend internationally that all of a sudden they're like that's who you are like that starts to get that positive reinforcement too i gotta imagine yeah well and they're just they were they turned out to be good for the winter yeah uh, they were warm yeah um, um and so did you like when you went to mckinsey were you rocking the cowboy boots in the office too not really in the office they, that was a little bit of a at the time i think it's a lot more gotten more casual along with everything else uh, in the last decade but yeah, that was more of a dress shoes and, and Brooks Brothers environment for better or for worse. But yeah, it was boots on the weekend and boots and bars and honky tonks and concerts on the weekend. And uh, then I ended up moving to New York and, and even and leaned even further in. So yeah, nice. And uh, how long were you at McKinsey? I did two years there and then uh, I worked for two years at a private equity firm based in Greenwich, Connecticut, but I lived uh, in Manhattan. Uh, Which firm? And those were my only 
two jobs I really had. Uh, it was called Catterton Partners at the time. Now they're called L. Catterton. Yeah. Uh, this was a donor, one of the pre- top consumer investors, period, on the private equity. Side. Yeah, they've really, uh, uh, it's another one where my resume looks probably better than it, it, it should have because at the time uh, they were a lot smaller. I mean, it was a great firm with great people and I was lucky to, to work there. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to get a job there now uh, uh, if I did it all over again with the well, same I experience. Think, I would say I appreciate how humble you're being, but at the same time, you know, I think it's a, what, first you're lucky, second time you're good. Like going from Harvard to McKinsey to Catterton to building a great company, I think you're all right. I think I, at this point, I don't think it's anything. It's something. Yeah. Like, well, I believe you could be lucky more than once, but yeah. <laughs> no, it, you can. It's just less lucky. But, <laughs> When you've done it four times, I think at some point you can take a little credit that maybe you did a couple of things right. So how was McKinsey? Just step back to that real quick. Like, what, what was that experience? It was an amazing place to develop a skill set and drink from a fire hose. I think for a lot of people, it is an amazing place to also build a career. It was pretty clear to me personally that I didn't, want to be in client services uh, after my first project or two. I just felt my, I wanted, you know, from, from, you know, brain to impact, I wanted to be more direct and I didn't find myself, you know, I think to be, to really love those places, I think you have to be a really curious person who gets bored, you know, honestly, a little easy and, and, and easily and wants to kind of go from problem to problem to problem. And you just want to be problem solving all the time. And I don't mind problem solving. Certainly some of my most interesting career moments when we're having to solve really challenging problems, but I wanted to make and I wanted to lead and I didn't see myself doing it there. So I was only there for a year and a half actually. So maybe I voted with my feet, but amazing people, probably the best just if if, if nothing, if, if I had to pick one superlative, like, the friends and colleagues I met even in that year and a half, I'm still in many ways closer with than almost anyone else I've ever worked with, um, you know, save for some of my lifetime to go as colleagues. So yeah, yeah pretty great place uh, for talent, um, networking and development. And so when you chose to leave for private equity, what was your thought process? Like, what was it about PE? Like, what did you want to do? Like, yeah, what? Yeah, it was two things for me. Um, one was I liked retail and consumer that much I had known and I had finally done a lift enough uh, thinking, intentional thinking about, you know, narrowing down the, the, my next stage in my career. And I had always been interested in, in consumer products and, you know, I was always buying the magazines for, for gear and cars and, and, you know, architecture, all, all the stuff that was that was sort of related to people consuming things for better or for worse. <laughs> and uh, so that was one angle. And I wasn't currently at the time working in any, any consumer projects and it felt like a little bit of an accelerator for me to get into that. Uh-huh. Uh, and the other one was I thought I wanted to learn about investing and, and the world of finance. I felt like, you know, if I could check both of those boxes, both general business management and consulting and, and then finance, I would be, I could kind of have a, the world is my oyster type moment afterward. Yep. I ended up not uh, doing finance <laughs> at Catterton. Oh, uh, they ended up creating, which ended up being fine, but they, but they actually created a operating group, yep. sort of an internal consulting group after I joined, right after I joined and I, I became, well, as I would have described it, sort of the guinea pig uh, associate in that group. and. Uh, and ended up turning out to be pretty fun. I was going to say, so you spent about two years just rolling your sleeves up with these businesses they were investing in to like... Yeah, it was all current portfolio focused work. I I kind of dabbled on one new deal because uh, I volunteered myself. Uh, we were thinking about uh, making a deal in the craft brewing space and I was really into craft beer at the time. <laughs> so I jumped into that and then proved myself entirely unhelpful and then uh, got off. But uh, yeah, I basically spent my time actually i think i traveled more there than i did at, at mckinsey I, so you're going I, in-house i was on a, all these was on a plane places. every week to yeah. I, most of my time was at a candy company actually so i, I know a lot about non-chocolate candy <laughs> production 
pricing and strategy. <laughs> there you go. The valuable things you learn in life. So exactly. You're there two years. Uh, and then did you go off to start Tecovis? Was that the next step? Yeah, I, uh, I applied to business school along with all of my classmates. I applied Is that the to thing you spent four years out and then go back? Is that like standard? It seemed like that's what everyone, yeah, I meant, I, sorry, I meant, I was referring to my job, my colleagues um, as sort of my, my higher end class at, at, at yeah. Catterton as well as consulting. But um, yeah, just it, it was kind of the thing to do. It's changed a bit since then. There's a little bit more flexibility, I think, on uh, whether you need to go to business school to, to advance to the next level in some of these, especially in uh, consulting firms. Yeah. But yeah, it felt like the thing to do. I, had a, I didn't have a great reason to apply, and, and I think it ended up coming out because I ended up getting rejected from the only two schools I applied to. Uh, I didn't even get an interview. And was it over an essay, or what? Why were you rejected? Well, I don't. They don't really. They don't tell you why. <laughs> yeah, they reject you. <laughs> yeah, too sure. I could okay. have get. I could guess. I mean, um, I think you know maybe a couple reasons. One, I think there's a lot of people. They could fill their class with people who looked like me if they wanted on the, on paper. You know, I didn't have a particularly good story to tell about why I wanted to go to business school. But I think uh, other than well, it feels like a fun thing to do. It feels like what people are doing right now in my stage. And, um, you know, can't you just let me in? <laughs> that, was, that was basically my approach, I think. Uh, it was probably a little bit uh, more specific than that, but I, I don't remember it being a particularly good application. Yeah. But it, in any case, it was a wake-up moment for me because that was sort of where I put my, my eggs in that basket. And I remember being at a happy hour with one of my colleagues and, Thinking, I guess. I mean, I guess I, I'm not getting kicked out. I guess I could stay. I kind of planned on leaving, though. So in my head, I was kind of, my, my, I was already one foot out the door mentally. Um, and we had a very stupid, naive conversation. Uh, I can say that in retrospect. That stupid, naive conversation was, "Hey, we've met a lot of entrepreneurs in this job. Almost all of the businesses that we invest in are still led by the founder." I feel like we know most of them and there's nothing special about them. <laughs> you know, like, they just seem like normal people. We seem as smart as them, as hard, as hard working. What, you know, it should be easy, right? And, you know, thankfully I had a couple beers and that was enough uh, for me to think through whether or not I should be an entrepreneur. And that's what got me started. Obviously I did a lot of thinking beyond that, but that was literally the moment where I thought about it and then I went back to my office, I think really the next week, uh, this was on a weekend, and started whiteboarding. And the first thing I whiteboarded was, at the time this was 2014, early 2014, so uh, a lot of businesses in the consumer space have started to adopt you know, an e-commerce oriented uh, brand model. Uh, you had your Warby Parker, Casper stories bubbling up, uh, all of which were too, early to kind of be on our right radar at the firm and you know we were more of a middle you know growth stage firm and so it felt like the right area to be looking at opportunity more early stage type businesses and and i looked down at my feet and i was wearing cowboy boots and i was like well let me start with myself what do i like what do i buy these boots are the most expensive thing that i own i think <laughs> um i and then i and I'm like well let's just put on the whiteboard and i'll think about other stuff and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I, every time I thought about a business angle, I would learn something about the category, about the dynamics of it that, that made it more intriguing or more appealing. Every time I thought about the product, I, I, I could feel an energy uh, you know, brewing and, and especially related to you know, what I thought might be missing, but also just the, the, the creative pull toward it. But you just, um, it's not, I mean, you had a strict passion for it, which I'm sure you know in hindsight, like having that when things are rocky and going up and down, loving what you do, being passionate about what you're putting out there gets you through that where that's where I'd say most businesses fail. Yeah, I agree uh, that that's important. I I wouldn't go so far as to describe it as an as, you know, a capital P passion. Okay. It was more something that I really enjoyed. I connected it. I related to it being a Texan. I had a very authentic 
product uh, story and experience that, that I felt, but I actually felt more close to the average consumer than I did a expert or a leader or someone who would go, maybe ultimately would might end up creating something rather niche. And I, I actually viewed that as a, as, a, as a pretty big positive because I, I entered into thinking about the category and the product more from the middle of the bell curve rather than you know the far end of it yeah um and that ended up being a lot more useful of a mindset i think to take um than others you know my goal was not to go build a niche custom super high-end uh boot business that was would be really challenging to scale my goal was to make the absolute best scaled brand out there and you know think about the elements that could drive larger market adoption without sacrificing that thing that I that made me passionate about it, which was the quality and the comfort and the look and everything. So there was certainly, I think it was a lot easier to be, to look at the market as a, hey, I'm still gonna be cognizant of, you know, how the, how the general dynamics are and I'm gonna try to build a better mousetrap for, yep. for the general category. Yeah, and so how long did it take you from whiteboard to launch? Yeah, light. So yeah, I guess it was like a spring 2014, and we launched in late October uh, 15. So about 18 months. Yeah, and was that but was it was, it was only I didn't I didn't like I didn't quit my job until July. I didn't move to Austin, which is where I wanted to build the company until August. Uh, I didn't visit the manufacturer uh, until kind of fall winter. So. I don't know, even even though it was, I had given myself enough lead time. I think it turned into kind of a scramble. Yeah, and no, 2015 I mean, it, it, to actually get it fast. off the ground. Yeah, and then yeah, day one, did it work? Were you like you got to market and you're like, wow, we got something here. I'm glad I did this. Or was like, how was that first week of launch? I mean, yeah. So maybe a, a bit of context. I, I so it was just me. Uh, you know, I, I worked on it. You know in a vacuum solo from you know full time from july 2014 through november 2015 and i was unclear if i want i was unsure if i wanted it to be fully bootstrapped do i want to go the venture route do i want to how big can this be and i struggled with all that and i, I ended up just kind of taking the middle ground and everything and so um i didn't want to just start with me shipping product out of my apartment uh, I didn't want it to feel like a whisper, you know, uh, yeah. in the dark as far as a launch goes. And so ultimately ended up raising some friends and family dollars as opposed to fully bootstrapping it. It was after I had already bootstrapped <laughs> it to a certain point. I had spent all my money and then some. I had an embarrassing amount of credit card debt for, for years. <laughs> Real quick uh, on that. <laughs> a lot of people have that and a lot of people don't talk about it. Like, where does your confidence from, come from that you are comfortable going, I'm going to rack up a bunch of debt because I'm committed and I'll figure it out. Like, it's not people being like, knowing you, you're not frivolous. You're not just like, ah, screw it. Like, there, what, where did that, again, confidence come from that you felt good about doing it? I actually do think I am relatively speaking to people who, you know, have similar levels of career ambition and, and maybe achievement for lack of a better word. I actually do think I'm on more of the, <laughs> on the risk uh, taking part of the spectrum. And, and I, I've never been, I've always been okay n knowing that I can, yeah, spend money to make money. <laughs> and and where does uh, that I wasn't put it this way. I wasn't like the best personal budgeter in, in my life. And, you know, I was always thinking more big picture and long term with how I thought about uh, spending. And, and listen, that was a, very fortunate, privileged position to be in, right? And so I think that the, the primary answer to your question is, yeah, there was definitely a level of belief and confidence. And I think that that identifying that as a actually a quality that I had was part of my entrepreneurial decision. Um, it, it was, because it was a hard leap to make. But the other element was, yeah, I think I just had a higher level of, of, of tolerance as well, for, for better, for worse ended up working out, but yeah, and that was an element of pride to, you know, I wanted to, I took raising capital from other people really, really seriously. I, I, 
I think that's been one interesting thing to observe about the market and the last 10 years of the bubble that we went through and has, that has since you know somewhat popped. But man, the number of entrepreneurs I, I heard or met that, that were just treating these millions of dollars they were raising as, as stuff that was kind of a given and, and maybe some of them felt entitled about it. And I, and I it, it kind of grossed me out, honestly, the last uh, four or five years seeing some of that. But that wasn't, you know, not to put myself on a high horse, that d definitely wasn't how I felt because I didn't even want to raise capital from other people. So right. when I did, I, I, you know, I was almost embarrassed to, to say, hey, can maybe we use some of that capital to, to pay me or to maybe pay off some of my credit card debt. And I didn't, I didn't end up, you know, paying my credit card debt for, for three or four years. Yeah. Just to, just to open yeah. up about it. <laughs> but, no, I, I've um, been, I was there too. The first, this is not my first company. First couple of companies racked up like 25 grand in debt. And, but I was like, I'll pay it off eventually and we'll figure it out. And again, this was also when I was like, paying myself minimum wage. So 25 grand in debt was like an annual salary. Yeah, that's like, a lot. But this gonna feel, I, but I'm like, but I'll get there, I'll be fine. Like there was something, oh, honestly at the time, probably a little irrational about like, I think I'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it is irrational, yeah. And I had to bet on that. And that was all part of the equation. It was like, well, if I'm gonna bet my career on this, what's the difference between betting another right. 30 grand? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I already bet my career. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, I, I say all that because I ended up, what was expectation? The expectations for me were not so low that it didn't matter, but they weren't sky high either. You know, I, yeah. I didn't, you know, go raise $5 million pre-product. Right. Like, you know, I already had product, you know, sitting in the, you know, on the line ready to get delivered. Um, I raised $500,000. Um, I set up what I thought was a reasonable sales goal of a million dollars in year one. Um, obviously, you know, that was what I thought was reasonable. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, the short answer is it did work. Uh, we did $2 million in our first year, but you know, uh, the first week was challenging, I'd say. Uh, like I, I knew that we had, that the product was decent. I knew that we had hit a bar on that, that you know, because I had waited to launch until I felt like we hit a bar that was that was, you know, the right place to be in at least for the first go, and which is I think a higher level, a uh, higher bar than say, uh, you know, maybe a SaaS business's uh, uh, beta product or um, MVP for that, you know, whatever you want to call it. Can't really take an MVP approach to a high end footwear product so uh you know it was beyond that yeah we uh, talked and then people approach us with mvp i'm like viable is an important part of that acronym like people will launch minimal products all yeah. the time but it's got to be viable yeah maybe that's the maybe that's maybe maybe it was an mvp but 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 to be viable it just had she had to be pretty good uh, as yeah. opposed to being a piece of crap yeah. <laughs> um so yeah we did i, I forget exactly I, th I think we did like like 20 grand the first day. Um, and I don't think we had, a, I don't think I had a zero in that first, that first holiday. I mean, it helped to be launching basically during holiday season, basically when the highest level of interest in, in buying and wearing boots is, you know, and I think we did a hundred K in our first 10 weeks. Uh, so obviously there was like an initial pop and then got kind of slow, but uh, we were, I was really, and then I ended up hiring some at the end of the year um, who then, ran the business with me throughout our first full calendar year in 2016, uh, Brandon. Uh, and man, he and I, <laughs> we would take, the, I, would, I had an old Forerunner that I had bought when I was on my last dollar. I sold my BMW and bought a Forerunner. I think it was like, you know, three or $4,000. <laughs> and, you know, we'd stuff as many boots as I can fit in it. I think it was like between 50 and 60, depending on if we were including men's or women's. And we'd go to farmers markets, we'd go to holiday markets, we'd go to junior league meetings. We'd go, we, yeah, we we actually, I'd say, an, an in, not a not insignificant part of our sales in those first few months were uh, physical sales, even though we were supposed to be the first. We were the first e-commerce oriented, you know, cowboy boot brand. But, but there's something to be said about the scrappiness of that. Like you were literally watching people's reaction to the product in person. Like the, the kind of benefits you get from that just 
can't be matched, I would think that would have a lot of impact. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that it was a noble goal, such as gathering product market insights. The truth is, it also just felt like a shirt that's like, hey, if we can just do like $5,000 of sales, you know, once or twice a month, then we'll pay our rent. Yep. And at least we're starting <laughs> somewhat in the black then. Yeah. It's no, and I mean, the, but that is, I like businesses that start that way. Like we need to make a business. We need to make money. We need to like actually pay some stuff because you, you kind of mentioned on the fundraising side and like we have a venture fund. I, we look at all types of businesses like this. And if you're not used to like, all right, like at some point this has to actually generate a profit and make some money and pay some bills. You end up with a year like last year where the fundraising dries up. And now I think this year you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies and a lot of these tech companies that just never learned that muscle, so to speak. Um, totally. And versus you, as things grow and ebb and flow, and you know, and go, keep going, you now know how to get back. You're like you understand the unit economics. You understand like this is how we actually make money with this. So, depending on the demand in the market and the economy and all that, you can flex that way. So yeah, it creates the right long-term success. So, at what point did you feel like I did it? Like, was there a point where it's like I arrived? Like, we are successful. Was it that first year? Was it? What was that first feeling of like, I'm successful. I made something, I built a great brand here. Yeah, I, I've, I've gotten a, a slightly different version of that question a lot that I've, I've had a hard time answering, but that, that maybe is a little better way to phrase it. What I don't know the answer to, there what, what there wasn't ever for me was like a, hey, this is working moment. I mean, it was always okay. a, it's working this much this day, this much the next, yeah. and we got to get to this place next month, this month, next year, this much, you know, and, Definitely always felt like, you know, boiling in a pot of water. Um, now, there were definitely a couple of moments where I took it, I kind of took a step back and looked around and felt, you know, proud uh, or, or impactful. And I think those moments stand out pretty clear in my mind. Um, when was the first one? I'd say when we. We're eclipsing our second, well, there, there was a couple of maybe fun moments to, to, to recognize. One was our second year. My uh, colleague and I made a bet on the sales number for that year, and this was before, I think we'd only had one, maybe it was three of us at that point. So still very, we were very slow to hire, for better or for worse. <laughs> and I, it became really clear that we were gonna just blow past that budget, or that number that we had, we had bet on. And the consequence was getting a tattoo. So um, <laughs> I, I of course, you know, bet on the downside so that yeah. I was it was a hedge, and so that when we beat it, at least I was getting a tattoo because we beat it. Um, yep. So I do have a Tacoma's tattoo on my bicep now. Nice. But uh, that was a great moment, and it was, and I remember being, we had, we were like backstage at a country concert, and you know, we had gifted the guys boots and we since become friends of ours and like that was like a hey i had a really cool job the business yeah. is working you know i'm getting a tattoo this is real you know <laughs> and then i think the maybe that ne the next moment was let's say a couple of years later when we built our first corporate office and you know 2019 and and, and i just looked around the room and there was this kind of toast moment and it always felt, you know, we were kind of moving from office to a co-working space to co-working space and yep. sublet to a weird room that doesn't you know, really fit our vibe to the next thing. And just to look around something that we had crafted, had it was purpose built for us, a, te a team of, I don't, I don't remember how many people at that point, maybe 30, 30 people around uh, the room. And you could just see pride in other people's space. I think that was the, that was the other moment. It was like the, the next degree. Was, was like, well, certainly I was, I thought it was cool where we were. I felt personally like I was doing what I wanted to do and creating something that had value, at least for myself and our customers and hopefully someday for our investors and, and, and all of our colleagues to, to benefit from. And, and it was that next layer that was like, oh man, all these people have jobs. Yeah. Like, and I started thinking about how many people had a job. And then I thought I started thinking about our uh, Mexico partners and everything. I just, yeah, I mean, it, it made me, it was that moment I think that every I think successful business owner ends up having at some point or another, which is like you're way more proud of the impact that you had on the people than yep. 
than you know the dollars in the PL or your bank account for that matter. Yep. And so where are you now? How many people work at Tecopus? Uh, we just, over 600 people on payroll between corporate office and retail field. And how many retail uh, think, stores do you have at this point? We have 30 retail stores. Wow. Uh, we started opening stores about four years ago. Uh, it's been a very important part of our business. It's uh, actually uh, around half, hovers around half or just under half of our revenue already. I remember um, when we met 2019, was it, no, 2020. You we were met, a, yeah, February 2020. Yeah, and you were telling me- I think, me that had, I, think I was about to open our sixth location. Yeah, yeah we, were, we had five at the time and it was probably 20% of our sales tops. Um, but you were bullish on it. Yeah, so we actually, uh, yeah, it's been a great move. I think, I'd say our corporate office is probably 120 nice. people, you know, in New York on the, the office that I'm sitting in. Uh, yeah. Of course, they're not always here. It's, yeah, that's how it works now. Not, but, uh, so, but I actually hired a, a, the biggest move I made was I hired a, uh, we, the board and I hired a CEO last year. So oh, you did? How's that? I am, I am, yeah, for a year, I, I've had a new role. My first new job in uh, nine years. <laughs> so, and what's, what's your role? I, I'm the executive chairman. Um, okay. Still, still serving, obviously, as founder, and um, yep. I'm chairman of the board, but my day-to-day -day role is uh, executive chairman. And been working side-by-side -side with uh, our CEO and our leadership team for a year now on that. It's been awesome. Yeah. Because I know that that's going to be super hard for some founders and, and to frankly find the right CEO too. That I know a lot of people that doesn't go very well, including a friend's Austin based company that is currently having a whole bunch of public disaster uh, scribe. If you're familiar with that whole story. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with what's going on over yeah, there. They, but they yeah, listen, it's a really, yeah, it's a really challenging, yeah, it's a challenging search, challenging decision. Um, it took me years to make the decision. Yeah. I, feel very fortunate that we were able to find someone who not only I trusted to lead the business, but who was also complimentary and had a partnership mindset with me, which I think obviously relieves a lot of the founder sort of stress and, and hair wringing, so hand wringing rather. So yeah, I, I, it's been it's been great. And I've been able to engage, awesome. you know, in the business and all the areas that I, I still enjoy and think I can have an impact while knowing that I'm you know, trusting him and the team to actually make all the day-to-day -day decisions. Makes sense. And so a couple more questions. Number one, what's next for you? I don't have anything next. Um, this is still uh, the I don't mean majority that of... Stepping away. I'm saying even with this, like what, what are you excited about coming down? What, what's exciting? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I often get the question, hey, you must be doing something else. It's like, yeah, yeah no, I actually, I just, I'm kind of just, I'm kind of just crap to the job that I wanted to have and I, it actually kind of worked out. It's been kind of fun. Um, uh, man, we're, we're doing a lot. There's a lot going on at Tecovas. Uh, we retail still a major part of our expansion strategy. You got a few more of those stores popping up this year. You know, another eight to 10 next year, I believe. We have, I mean, we've, for a while, actually, we've been building other categories uh, within, you know, under the Tecovas. Yep. We're still we're one brand still. It's all we sell. We our stores are you know, and our online site are the only places that we sell Tacovas, and we only sell Tacovas stuff. You know, so really cultivating that ecosystem on the product side has been really fun. We we've, uh, I'd say, you know, as a product physical product oriented business that has, you know, calendars that seem to get longer as as the business gets bigger and better. What we do it's. It can be sometimes frustrating to yeah. you know like, oh man, let's wait for next year or spring yeah. 24 or fall 24. And we got all this really cool stuff coming out. And you know, the truth is everything's great today too, but it's one. Of, it's also exciting. It also is a way to, to keep uh, myself, the team, everyone really engaged and knowing that like, we're always getting better. We're always adding, we're always improving. Um, we're, you know, we've got, you know, we're men's and women's. We do footwear, accessories and apparel, I'd say, you know, a lot more focus right now on, on growing our non-footwear categories than we've given before. We're about 80% footwear today. Uh, you know, maybe that number will shift down a little bit over time. Uh, women's business is growing off the chart. It's awesome. We've finally got some really good merchandising design attention there the last year and, and 
moving forward. Yeah, I mean, we're just rocking and rolling. It's, uh, we're glad we're private. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't have to deal with the rigmarole of the market and yeah. where stock prices every day. Um, we might be, you know, public someday down the road, but uh, for now I'll enjoy not stressing out about my public portfolio every day. Yep, it's a good way to do it. Um, and so last question for you, what's one piece of advice you'd give to someone that's like looking to pursue their dreams, whatever that might be, whether it's entrepreneurial or some other uh, vocation, but like someone that, something you either wish you heard or you did hear that really kept you going because I know it sounds like a straight line, but it never is. Well, yeah, there's a piece of advice right there. Definitely not a straight line. I'd say for me, whether or not I wish I had heard this, I'm not sure, but I, if I had to think about what has uh, led to me personally feeling most fulfilled and therefore I imagine successful because if you don't feel fulfilled, you're, you might, uh, you might struggle is being honest about what's different about you. And you can be inspired all you want by other stories, other people, you know, what you might, what you might interpret as entrepreneurial nature, but um, everyone brings something pretty different to the table. And I think it was me actually being cognizant of what made me different and not necessarily good or bad, just different that ended up leading to what I wanted to focus on, leading me to ultimately make the decision to jump in and, and do it, do what I did the way I did it. And I think too many people that I've talked to who are kind of contemplating entrepreneurial careers, um, whether that's literally starting a business or a brand or you know something else in the entrepreneurial path, they've always, they just, they want to kind of copy paste. They, they want to get advice. They want the mentorship that's basically just tell me what to do. and. You know, I think one big flaw that I had, because I'd, I'd say maybe hypocritically, I would say talk to a lot of people, get great mentorship. I didn't have good mentor. I didn't talk to a lot of people, to be honest. I I I knew that I had to solve a problem. Like most important, this is maybe where it's where the where the council is a little bit uh, controversial. Is you know you can read all the books and talk to all the people you want, but ultimately the only thing that really matters is that you're you're creating something that that fills a gap that, that people want, whether that's one really important thing or, you know, many things that can, that, that many people want. And I became obsessed with that. And, and I, and I did because that was what I was personally obsessed with and not necessarily boots, but, but the idea of creating something really special. And so if you don't have that, then, you know, it, it might not be the right career. <laughs> So. No, it's, I mean, if you have a great product that people want, everything else is easy. And if you don't, everything is hard. And I say yeah. easy subjectively, obviously. Every, I think running a business is never easy. But Yeah, yeah. It's type two fun, type two easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Paul, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for hosting. Absolutely.